Good afternoon, everyone. My topic of discussion is anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism. As you all know that this is a very important topic from so many perspectives. It is important from democracy point of view. It is important from the national integration point of view, from the national security point of view. So this is a very apt topic for the public policy students, academicians, professors, and citizens, everyone alike. This would be my scheme of presentation. I'll start with an introduction, and then I will dwell on what is, anti -mon what is money laundering, and what is the scheme of money laundering, and what is the international framework, that is the financial action task force that exists, and what are the institutions and the enforcement mechanism that exists in all the countries, and especially in USA, and what are the challenges, and what is the way forward. The terrorist in today's world, they don't operate the way they used to 10, 20 years before. It is very difficult to find a terrorist in the traditional sense of the term. But the terrorists and the terrorist organization, they are present everywhere. They are present in our financial system. They are present in the banks. They are present in stock exchanges. They might be as the CMD of some corporates or some shell company. So the terrorist, anti-money laundering and terrorist financing, counter-financing of terrorism becomes very, very important. This is a schematic presentation that, that I tried for the participants and for the listeners, how the money laundering and financing of terrorism that leads to the terrorism acts and how it destabilizes our financial systems and the integrity of our financial systems and ultimately how it destabilizes the democracies, which is the ultimate objective and the aim of the terrorists and the terrorist organizations. In the business management, we all study that there are five important components, which is five amps of business management, which is man, machine, market, material, and money. So this is exactly the today's terrorist and the terrorist organizations, they operate in a very corporate way. They don't operate in a tra traditional way. So they have the man, the terrorists, they have the money, that illegitimate money, which they tend to launder through the banks and the financial systems. And the market for them is the whole globe. The all of us, we are the consumers, the whole world, the democracies, they are the markets for, the, for, the, for terrorists and the terrorist activities. And they use different kind of materials which may be chemicals, which may be organisms, which may be equipments, which may be substances, technologies, and the machines, as we know that they use computers, they use analytics, they use weapons, they use guns, and what not. So this is 5M model of a globalized corporate terrorists. And how do they use money? Where, where do they use this money for? They use it to recruit people. They use it for training. They use it for the logistics purposes. They use it for manufacturing, for buying of the weapons. And they have the state-of-the-art weapons. And they have the equipments, they have the computers, they have the materials, they have to bribe, they have to infiltrate the systems. And they buy assets, they buy motorboats, everything. So this is how the money that is used by them. So now in today's topic, we will move how the illegitimate money is earned from various sources, how it is laundered, what are the mechanisms, and what is the schema of laundering of money and how it is used by various terrorists and the terrorist organizations. This is a vicious cycle of money laundering and, counter and the financing of terrorism. Like it is dirty money that is earned by them, by the terrorists. It is laundered by using, abusing the vulnerabilities of the financial system markets. And then it is invested in the industry. They operate as corporates. They invest money. And as you, as you all know that money begets money, their financial power that grows, they become strong entities, and it is used to finance the terrorist activities. And with those, they again indulge into illegal activities. And these are the sources of legitimate money, which could be a large number of items, which are known as, in the enforcement terms, as the predicate offenses. So these are the offenses through which, which are the offenses for the legal persons, but these are the offenses through which they raise money, that is, they indulge into people smuggling, arms trafficking, 
theft, tax evasion, terrorism, drug trafficking. How does the tax evasion take place? It takes place through a number of means. Through the misuse of exemptions of various schemes. There are so many incentive schemes, for example, which are misused by these terrorist and terrorist organizations and other people. And then the export uh, incentive schemes, there are certain articles or items which are restricted or prohibited. So those items are smuggled out. There is a misdeclaration, outright smuggling. Then the corruption practices in contracts, in sports, in tenders, in purchases, bribery, defense deals, and the private companies, they also indulge into corruption and corrupt practices. And as we know, the narcotics has a very strong relationship with the terrorist activities, which is known as in the form of narco-terrorism, that they provide protection to the terrorists for the movement of their arms. And the, they sell L LSDs, marijuana, and synthetic drugs, which is the new addition in the category of drugs heroin, cocaine, etc., and those psychotropic substances and synthetic drugs. So this is how they earn, they sell it, they earn illegitimate money, and this is how this money is available to them for laundering. Human trafficking that we have seen that large number of people, they come, they migrate in search of employment, education, entertainment, primarily it is employment, and searching for the jobs. And this is how these agents and those people, they. Uh, take money, huge amount of money. And then another additional category that has been added to them, to this sources of illegitimate money is the environmental crimes. There are a large number of items which fall in the category of environmental crimes. There is a CITES and convention, which is known as Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species. Like the tusks in India, for example, they have been a large uh, amount of smuggling of, a large number of cases of smuggling of uh, red senders which is a restricted item, prohibited item under CITES convention. And then ozone depleting substances, hazardous waste, and flora and faunas, which are restricted. So those all constitute the income from them that constitute as uh, a legitimate money, and that is an environmental crime. That is a new category. Another category that could be added is IPR violations, intellectual property right violations. So a large number of fake goods are made and those are, of course, those people, those who are trading in or making fake goods, they use those raw materials and those items which are not accounted for, and that is an illegitimate money. And counterfeit of currency is another area. This is how straight away you earn money without doing anything. You just have to have the state-of-the-art machines. Now we have computers we can, which can print money using all those ink and type of papers that they have access to. And in some cases, for example, in India, we have found that some countries, they have the state-sponsored kind of uh, uh, these linkages and this is how they are these machines and materials are made available and the count the uh, terrorist and the terrorist organization they have access to the counterfeit currency and there are scheme which are as I have already told scams and Ponzi schemes so these kind of schemes these are all sources of legitimate money and this is I have tried to show in a very humorous way how the Republic of from Republic of watermelon to Republic of banana this connotes that those countries which have a weak institutional mechanism, which don't have strong enforcement machinery, how it is easier for these countries to move in a wholesale manner the money from through air, through land, through land roads. And this goes into other countries which have the similar arrangements. There is a porous border. Or there are certain, because there is a limitation of the government resources, and government cannot put their, deploy their resources at all the places. So there are certain areas which are porous through which the movement of these money, large amount of money that is earned through illegitimate means that moves through these porous borders to the people, uh, the Republic of Banana. So there are a large number of countries which become Banana Republic because they don't have their institutional mechanism, they don't have enforcement mechanism in place. And that, this is how it is easier for these countries to move. And these are the distribution channels for the illegal money. And this is another way of depicting that how the proceeds of crime from those different illegal activities that get siphon, that get poured into the machine that is the financial system, the financial institutions, stock markets, and how it is laundered. So this are systems which are vulnerable if these are not properly monitored, not properly regulated. And this is how the money goes into it and it comes out, the in input of the legitimate money that comes out, the output of the clean and the laundered money. 
and this clean money, the dictum to the AML and CFT policy, anti-money laundering and counterfinancing of uh, is uh, terrorism is based on the dictum, follow the money. So if you follow the money, we will be able to track it, whether it is in formal form in, or in the informal way. And this is a schema of how the money laundering is done, how the dirty money or the money earned from the illegitimate sources is converted into white money. It is a three-layered process. It involves three stages, placement, and then is layering, also known as structuring, and third is integration. Once the money is earned through the illegitimate means, then it is very risky to keep that money in physical form. The person becomes vulnerable, and he wants to distance from the source. So therefore, because it is difficult for him to keep it can, he can be easily detected and he wants he can't use it in an open fashion every for example in developed nations most of the developed nations and developing countries now there is a trend that, towards a cashless economy so they have to use the banking system to buy things to purchase things to spend that money that money is would be of no use if it's kept as it is in the physical form therefore it has to be placed in a bank in the economic institutions in an organized fashion so that they can earn profit from it. They can transfer it through the bank to a company, to a trading, through a trading, and they can buy a set and material. And the second is the layering, structuring. So they transfer it through banking institutions, through off offshore banking, financial banking institutions. And another, one of the methods is the trade-based money laundering. The goods, they move in one direction and the money moves in the other direction. So there are a large number of mechanisms available like the overvaluation, undervaluation. So therefore, through that, the money is transferred to other countries, to the offshore banks. It is transferred through the wire transfers. And there are so many other economic instruments like bond, shares, TBL, trans, uh, the trade-based money laundering. And ultimately, this money, illegitimate money that comes back to the criminal as a clean and laundered money and he's able to invest it in the company and then money begets money. He becomes a rich man and then he uses it for further fueling the anti-national activities, the terrorist activities. This is another schema. It is slightly complex. It shows how the collect dirty money is collected, how it is placed in a bank, it integrates into system and then the terrorists, they have, they use a maze of shell companies because they don't want the, its origin to be traced. So for that, it, the funds would be transferred to, let's say, bank account in company X. And then it would wire transfer it to some other offshore bank through trade based, uh, through the trade or through some other means or through the banking channel. It will give, let's say, loan to company Y and company Y would give it on a false invoice. There would be no transaction of the goods and services. It will go to X. And this is how the company, there would be maze of transaction and the money would be rotated. And this is, and then it will be ultimately integrated and the financial assets, et cetera, that would be purchased. And again, it is recycled back into the terrorists, to the terrorists. Now we come to the third actor in the whole scheme of things. After the illegitimate money is earned, it is laundered, then it reaches in the hands of terrorists and the terrorist organizations. So as per one estimate, as per one report by the Financial Action Task Force, ISIL had generated and had access to about half a billion US dollars by the end of 2014. So that is the extent of the financial power, the muscle, financial muscle that they have. What is FATF? FATF is an institutional mechanism. This is very, very important. Uh, intergovernmental body that was established in 1989. It has its headquarter in Paris and 136 countries are its member. It is the body which sets for the international standards and all those standards that are followed by all the member countries. As a result of this recommendation, this body is so powerful that as a result of the recommendation of this body, new legislation have come in all the member countries, new enforcement machineries have come, new financial intelligence collection machinery like which is known as financial intelligence unit, FIU. In US it is known as FinCEN, 
Financial uh, Criminal Enforcement Unit. So it is very, very important body which has its recommendation which are known as 40 plus 9 recommendation. 40 are general money laundering recommendations. Recommendation connected with how to stop money laundering, how to have institutional mechanism, how to have the uh, regulatory mechanism, regulatory framework and how to have an enforcement framework. And it measures the compliance on two crit uh, criteria. Number one is technical compliance and effectiveness. There may be institutions in a country in physical form, but it may not be effective. For example, there may be a police organization, there may be a custom organization, there may be financial intelligence unit. But if the outcome is not proportionate, then it is of no use. So it measures the effectiveness that whether in physical form the institution is present, the enforcement machinery is present, and how is the effectiveness? To what an extent it has been able to uh, take those uh, uh, crimes uh, proceedings to the logical conclusion. And then it prescribed that this has to be international cooperation. And it criminalizes the offenses, money laundering and terrorist financing offenses. And it has prescribed that each country should have a set for features and confiscation. And it prescribes for the exchange of information and proliferation of financing for the weapons of mass destruction is another recommendation which has been introduced in 2008, I think, as a result of the FATF. So now any activity which relates to uh, proliferation of financing which would lead to weapons of mass destruction that is also criminalized and all those assets etc that would become liable for assets would become liable for confiscation and seizure and these are the FATF recommendations some of the important recommendations uh, that I would uh, go into for example it terrorist financing offenses that have been criminalized as a result of this recommendation in all the member countries it is next recommendation is customer due diligence CDD that is know your customer. It has prescribed that all those banks, financial institutions, before entering into a business contract with their customer, they should have. They should know who they are, from where the money is coming, and it should know about. It should do the due diligence with respect to the identity of those customers. And there is new category which is known as designated non-financial business and professions DNFBP which consists of casino dealers, property dealers, then lawyers, accountants, gems and jewelry dealers, TCSP that is trust and company service providers that is lawyers, accountants who facilitate in the formation of companies which is an instrument through which the laundering tax takes place. So those TCPs, lawyers, real estate agencies. So with respect to these as a result of FATF recommendation and institutional mechanism and reporting entities that have been created. So it is imperative for the financial system to have, excuse me, information with respect to these people. Then there is new concept of beneficial ownership. When the US United States mutual evaluation that was conducted in January 2015, it was found that there was certain deficiency in with respect to beneficial owner. Beneficial owner concept means that the terrorists, they are very intelligent people, or whosoever earns the money through the illegitimate means they are very intelligent people. They know how to distance themselves from that entity, entity, and therefore, they will create a front company which would have some other front person who would act as the managing director or who would manage that company. And therefore, as a result of FATF recommendation, it is imperative that the financial institution, they should know, they should have the information and data about the beneficial ownership. And this has been incorporated back home in my country. And then there are the report, and as a result of financial, uh, this FATF recommendations, Financial Action Task Force recommendation, it is imperative that each country has a financial intelligence unit, FIU. In USA, it is known as FinCEN. In India, it is FIU Int. It, there are 140 number of FIUs all over the world and they have a mesh or a network of exchange of information and it takes place through uh, and they have an association they have a group known as Agment group which is again an international association of the financial intelligence units all over the world which meets regularly and which exchanges notes and information actively on real time basis and they are very, very technologically sound institution that we would talk about in the next slides. Then another recommendation is with respect to the PAPs, which is a politically exposed persons. 
politically exposed persons are those persons who are in the various capacities in the power. They are part of the government and they would definitely, they can influence the decision. They can influence decision with respect to the companies, with respect to business dealings. Therefore, the banks and these financial institutions, they are required to carry extra customer due diligence, enhanced, which is known as enhanced CDD measures for the PAPs. Then again, wire transfer, all those transactions which is taking place beyond a threshold. Uh, by the way, FIU, uh, the uh, wire transfers that have to be uh, reported, and then the money value services, it is recommendation 14. It requires, whatever recommendation requires, that there has to be international cooperation amongst its member countries. And a new recommendation, as I pointed out earlier, recommendation number seven, that makes the weapons of mass destruction and proliferation financing as uh, criminalized offenses. And then again, the, as a result of recommendation number six, the targeted financial trans, uh, the sanctions that are imposed by the United Nations Security Council through various resolutions. I think. So this is the framework I have talk, talked about. It is an institutional framework which is established as a, as a result of the FARF recommendation. FIUs are, have been established, FinCEN in USA. Then the legally, at domestic level, laws have been made for example, in US, it is the Banking Secrecy Act, which has been established. In my country, it is known as Prevention of Money Laundering Act, PMLA. And then there are various regulations and rules which have been subsequently framed owing to the recommendations of FARF. And then there are various uh, legal mechanisms, AMLAT, Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties, ALAS, Letter Rogatories. When one country sends a request for seeking one particular information, so those have to be executed through the legal means. And there are administrative measures like mutual evaluation reports, peer-to-peer -peer review, national risk assessment. And the FATF meets regularly after every six months in Paris through the, and it conducts, it has plenary sessions. And then there are enforcement agencies that I would be talking about, Internal Revenue Service, Criminal Investigation in USA. Back home, it is in Indian Revenue Service, Customs and Excise and Income Tax Department in India and CBP, Customs, Border Protection, and FBI. So these are the institutional mechanism which has been established for the anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism all over the world. This is the FENCIN which has been, which derives its authority at par under the Patriot Act and under Section 311, DSA, Banking Secrecy Act, and it operates on the, it, it has got large number of institutions which report to it and which generate reports which are known as suspicious transaction reports and cash transaction reports and special and suspicious activity reports. All these reports, they come to the financial intelligence unit. You can see that STRs, CTRs, banks, insurance, financial institutions. These are the institutions which <coughs> send reports periodically to the financial intelligence units, which is mandatory. It is statutory. These are banks and credit unions, money remitters, uh, then check cashers, virtual currency exchanges, dealers in foreign exchange, casinos and card clubs, insurance companies, securities and future brokers, all these people. And then these are the vulnerable sectors. Why the reporting entities, they are, they are supposed to report. The logic is that these sectors, they are very vulnerable sector, a large chunk of cash that can be put in, into these sectors and they will, there are, so far as the uh, reporting standards are concerned, which are very, very lax. Therefore, it has been mandated by the law to report, to have a reporting from these sectors like casinos. One can go to casino, put his black money and buy the coupons. And ultimately then he can deposit these coupons in the bank. Bank will not know, he can tell that I got this money from the casino, I won this. Then the brokers and the dealers in gems and precious. It is very difficult to know the quality of a precious or a semi-precious stone. It can be $100, it can be $1,000, it can be $20,000. So it is very, very difficult. So same article that can be overvalued. It can be purchased for $2,000, something which is worth $1. Insurance companies, again, it, is a, it would be important to mention here that when Bin Laden was not Bin Laden, he laundered a lot of his money through the, through the instrumentality of the insurance company. How would he do that? He would have a lot of black money and 
he would and his companies and his all other network, they would pay that amount black money in the form of that installments, and the companies they would they would accept that cash, and instead of 20 years period, instead of 10 years insured period, they will have the old money deposited in let's say three four years period, and that the insurance company will give them the check, so his money is laundered, and he will take the check and deposit in the bank. The bank will think that this money has been earned from the from uh, as a result of the insurance. Uh, settlements by the insurance companies. So the insurance companies also are quite vulnerable in formal value transfer system to the, as we know that this is a new system, then mining and extractive industry, NPOs, and these are all vulnerable sectors. Therefore, it is mandatory to have requirements for uh, reporting requirements to FIU. And the FIU has got the models and the analytics. It, it, it makes use of that data and it on the basis of patterns, on the basis of outliers, and then it disseminates the information to different departments, Custom Border Protection, FBI, Immigration Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security, Internal Revenue Service, and then it also has a two-way flow of the information with respect to 140 foreign FIUs. Then it's very interesting to note the report on ISIL. The FATF conducted a study on ISIL. And it found these different things that it has got its various sources of finance, which is bank looting, human trafficking, control of oil and gas reservoir, cash in bank. The ISIL considers that those government owned bank, they are the property of ISIL. And the private, the money is kept in the vaults, they don't have much control. There, whenever whosoever withdraws the money, they charge money they, as a tax, as a protection money, which is the normal way. Then they have salary payment to the Iraqi government employees. Then they take a cut in that, 5%, kidnapping for ransom, cultural artifacts, involuntary donations, and then fundraising to the modern networks. I still generated excess to half a billion that I have mentioned earlier. Then the cash in local currencies that have to be converted into foreign exchange. This is how there is an interface between the foreign exchange and these people. And ISIL has got its branches in Mosul, Iraq, second big city, which is financial capital, Fallujah, and Ramadi, and like these other places, one in Syria and another in Iraq. These are two, three cases that I would like to shortly mention. How the terrorists and the terrorist organization, they have misused the existing system. This is in 2015, uh, Saudi competent authorities, they addressed, they found that there was, uh, internet was being used, there were appeals by different organizations to donate, and they gave the account number, that the charity amount that could be donated in these, these accounts. These are the domestic accounts, and these, if you want to transfer the money abroad, then these are the international accounts. And then the Saudi uh, competent authorities, they intercepted that account, and they froze it, and then 61 bank accounts, they were blocked. Terrorists and the terrorist organization, they were making an appeal through using the internet system that these money would be used for the charities, and the gullible people, they don't know where the money would ultimately end in. Then the criminalizing of the ransom money, this is another interesting case. Then in the United, uh, United Kingdom, the insurance law, they had a flaw. They were settling all the claims for the insurance. People get, uh, and then those uh, claims, they were being settled, and they found that the, those, in fact, those ransom was being paid by those people, and insurance companies, they were settling the claim for the ransom, which was ultimately paid to the terrorists. So they made a bill. The bill has yet to be passed. It has not become an act by the UK government, and the UK government drafted a new law making such payment as illegal. Otherwise, it was being some terrorists will kidnap, insurance company will pay money, and that money, that would be ultimately going to terrorists. Terrorist. And this is how this was a big, big lacuna. And then the targeted financial section, Aust Australian foreign minister listed two individuals. And the illegal assets were frozen under the part four of the United Nations Act. Then I come to briefly would touch upon the law, law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies, which is connected with, now we have done how the money comes from, how it is laundered, how it is misused using the financial different financial channels. And now we will come to how the different enforcement agencies carry which kind of operations. 
the main agencies that we have already touched upon, the ICE, that Immigration Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security and CBP, IRS, Internal Revenue Service, uh, and uh, Criminal Investigation, FinCEN, FIU, then FBI and the police. We will come to the challenges. What are the challenges? These are the challenges. The terrorists, they also have kept pace with technology. As we saw in the very first slide, they behave in a very, and they operate in a corporatized manner. Bitcoin's virtual currency is a very, very big challenge. A huge amount of money that can be held in the form of Bitcoins, and you will not know, as you know, that Bitcoin is a mathematically modelly generated currency. It cannot be just bought like that. You have to solve the puzzle, which is quite difficult, but it can be sh shifted from one person to another person. And this is very, very important area. And newer technology, 4 dimension 4D technology printing, that, is, that poses another uh, challenge. For example, there will not be any movement of goods. There will not be movements of any uh, material from one border to another border. Therefore, the customs, CBP, etc., they can't do a thing about it. So ultimately, a terrorist or the terrorist organization, he will have a 4D at his home or as an institution. And then he'll have the inputs, which will be procured locally. And they will put it in the 4D computer and 4D printer and generate whatever inputs or whatever things that he requires. So this is a big challenge for the enforcement agencies, for the FBI, for the IRS, for the military, for everything, for everyone, all those institutions. There is a very big, big, it's a newer technology. So we, ha we need to know who is buying 4D printers. 4D printer is very, very important. So dark web is another area that I recently myself learned that it is an area where IP address, you will not know the IP address will be keep on changing. And you will not know who operated which site and from which IP address, internet protocol address. So that would be very, very difficult. Then there are other traditional sectors like Hawala, et cetera, which are very, very difficult. And it is not possible because those are informal trust-based kind of transactions where money is transferred from one country to another country. Then there is a saying that if the God or if the, those who are the custodian of the system, they start eating into the system, then what will happen to the system? So if this terrorism is sponsored by the state and it has all the backing, the banks belong to state being misused by terrorists, institution enforcement institutions belonging to state being instructed not to do with respect to XYZ categories of terrorist or terrorist organization. You can't do anything. So that is a big challenge. And there are non-state actors. How do you identify those people? They have no identity. Their identity keeps on transmutating, changing. So it's very difficult. Then shell companies have already spoken about the beneficial ownership. Who are the real owners of those companies? They would have a maze of company. I'll put money in X. X money will be transferred to Y, Y to Z, Z to C, C to B, B to A, and A to again. It will coming back. So it will be very, very difficult to keep the audit trail of such transactions. That is a big challenge. And then beneficial ownership, trade-based money laundering, and weapons of mass destruction. Very, very. It is again a big challenge. Why? Because the authorities and the institutions, they are not equipped to know whether this material, they don't know for certain that whether it can be used by the terrorist. It can be used for peaceful purposes. It can be used for manufacturing the legitimate goods. At the same time, those chemicals and substances and organisms and materials and technology can be used like the nuclear energy, we say, debate. It can be used for the peaceful purposes. It can be used for making a bomb. Likewise, the SCOMET materials, which is known as the dual use material. SCOMET stands for special uh, organisms and organisms, SCO, organism, material, technology, substances, etc. Substance, special chemical organism, material, equipments, and technology. And they bring it in bits and bits and pieces from one port, another port. So we'll not know that it is not come in one whole piece. So that is a big challenge. And this is a way forward that all the international communities, communities that is the institutions, enforcement machineries, they need to have a regular exchange of information on real time basis. We can't have simple exchange of information. It has to be on the real time basis if we have to nab the culprits. There has to be enhanced international cooperation. And we have to move, have a very coordinated action. There has to be a sick, we have to invest a lot in IT infrastructure to build a strong and robust IT uh, architecture. 
the capacity has to be built, people have to be sensitized, it has to be spread across how this is a very, very important challenge and that, uh, that need to be taken care of, then we have to use of geospatial intelligence, human int and all those kind of intelligence things and we have to use the technology to counter the technology that the terrorists are using and then we, we have to move toward a swift forfeiture of the assets and properties. If we seize their assets and properties, certainly it would be difficult for them to operate. They can't have unlimited access to unlimited resources, faster trials and prosecutions. So let's take a pledge to combat and stop terrorism by doing our might in wherever we are and whatever capacity we are. Thank you very much. One which are already compliant and they are quite sensitive to the needs of these FATF recommendations and need for amendments in their law legislation and they are keeping pace with the FATF recommendation. There are certain areas where the, recommendation, where the amendments that would need to be made in the legislation, in the domestic legislation, that would be with respect to weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapon conventions, SCOMET material, there exist, there are gaps in the legislation in many of the countries. So those are the areas, the legislation is not that strong. Second part where I would like the, and where there is a need for having a proper legislation would be, would be with respect to for feature of the assets and property and seizures. And then third is the PEP, politically exposed person. Many of the countries, they don't have proper legislation with respect to the politically exposed persons because these are the political masters, these are the persons in executive who have to frame these rules and regulation. And ultimately, it would tend to, amount to, uh, tend to amount to harming their own interests if they have some vested interests. So those are three areas. But there are some other non-compliant countries which are known as high-risk jurisdiction. There, there is a lot of need not only to undertake these new legislation that I've just mentioned, but the other recommendations also, they are not fully compliant. They are partially compliant. Countries like Algeria, Angola, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Panama, Panama, Papua New Guinea, Syria, Uganda, Yemen, Democratic Republic of Korea. So these are the countries where there is a huge gap so far as the legislation is concerned, rules, regulations, and regulatory and supervisory me mechanisms are concerned. Yes, sir. So, there are countries which is tax-free zones. Yes. And they are also not part of the, the, any, any of the secretaries. How the anti lobbying is going to tackle That is really important question. Large number of countries like Cayman Island, British Virginia Island, Hong Kong, Singapore, Lachistan, Luxembourg, Cook Island, Bahamas, Bermuda Island, etc. They are all tax seven countries. And if you see, 50 years back, the number of countries all over the world we used to have, United Nations has only 80, 80 or 100 number of nations. But now, some of the countries which have mischievously created a small jurisdiction which are independent, and therefore the number of countries that has gone up to, I think it is 170 or 180 or something plus. So these are the small, small island countries which are independent from policy making point of view, and which are the hot bed of uh, money laundering operations. There, there, there is problem because it cannot be enforced, uh, the, uh, the threat of recommendation that cannot be, it is a persuasive process. So ultimately those countries, they would be becoming the target of financial sanctions. Then those countries who are signatory countries, they would be having differential treatment with respect to these nations if they have trade. But 
fortunate, unfortunately, these countries, they don't have much of the trade. They operate on these things. So there it would be a persuasive kind of approach that is being undertaken, soft diplomatic engagement with these countries. Otherwise, uh, it is a big problem. And they are becoming part of the red flag indicators of the system. So if there is any transaction, if we can't have control over the other destination, at least in the origin, we can have control. If something go is going directly to them or indirectly to these, these countries, which are acting as tax haven, certainly we can impose certain restrictions on the movements of the goods and services. So this is an indirect way of tackling this problem. But yes, I agree, these are mischievous countries. These are mischievous, uh, mischievous islands. But certainly, they have been improvements. For example, Switzerland was also known to be such a country which was a safe haven. It is not so now. Why? They also have responded to these changes. Similarly, maybe it is a matter of time that these countries also would come around and there would be pressures put by the international community to bring them in the mainstream. But yes, they are the problem. Yeah, yes. yes. How do you think that the IRA and FIP had been able to check and balance the Hawala transactions? You see, Hawala transactions are outside the uh, system, technological system. So, so far as FIU is concerned, there would be no reporting. If there is no reporting, there would be no case building. Yes, FIU would have, if not the financial data, FIU in India, for example, and income tax department, the Indian Revenue Service, whom Madam represents here with us, they have a 360 degree profiling system, RDA BMS, Relational Database Management System. So, they would know who is having how many companies which are the private limited company, which are the limited companies, which are the small companies, which are the proprietorship companies, how many new companies have come, how much is the wealth, how many new companies they have abroad. So some sort of, some sort of idea they would have about, about the risks, about the transaction they might be having, which might fall outside the regular reporting technological system. So there it would be human interrogation intervention and they have their own intelligence machinery which would be pressed into, into services. And they would know and find out that whosoever, and then they have the corollary evidences and other evidences, circumstantial documentary and corroborative evidences. So they would, they are smart enough to build up the case. Even if a direct symptom doesn't come, they would be in direct methods of tackling the problem. Yes. This is regarding pattern. You were saying that uh, there are 136 countries which have joined pattern. I would like to know why the other countries have not joined. Are there technological barriers or there are some other factors the countries are not coming up and joining? Other countries, yes, many of the other countries who have not joined, they are still observing the process. They are they have the observer status. They are not full fledged member. It is not a treaty. It is a voluntary membership. And it is supposed to be respectable, prestigious. No one wants to be known and seen that yes, we promote. If we are not, let's say, there is a pledge here that don't indulge into sexual molestation activities. Let's take pledge. So those people who don't go there, there would be more pressure on them. That what do you think? Why you are not going and taking a pledge? Likewise, this is a good example I am taking. Likewise, this FATF membership is quite prestigious. It has got so many other consequences, which are economic consequences. So those people, they are weighing it. There are technological barriers. Yes, they don't have the capacities. Or maybe they don't have that much risk. It is not important that each and every country joins. Then only they would be. There are informal methods also. And there are certain small economies, small countries, which may not have a highly technological advanced system. They are the cash economies. That doesn't mean that they are vulnerable. They are the risk. It is a risk-based approach that FATF is resorting to. So some of those countries, they think that they are OK. FATF also thinks they are, they, are, they are not the risks. And therefore, they are not member. FATF is not pressurizing them. They are also not becoming member. And because that would entail having institutions extra cost to them, they are very, very small countries. So there is no need for them to be member of those countries. Yes, there are certain other high risk jurisdiction. They are member. They are known to be having some vulnerabilities in the system. They have opted to be member to demonstrate that yes we are a respectable community international and we would like to be we would like to uh, combat this menace of money laundering and financing of terrorism they have certain 
problems, they have certain issues. But institutions like FATF, World Bank, IMF, they provide hand-holding and technical and other kind of support to them. It is not necessary that each and every country to demonstrate that they are an AML and CFT compliance, they become, there are also certain other methods. Yes. It's more effective to have independent agents, agents in the country to fight this uh, money laundering, or it's uh, just an issue of implementation of legislation. And if uh, there are different uh, agencies like Internal Minister of Internal Affairs, Prosecutor's Office, they can cooperate effectively. Or it's again independence is ne necessary for effective fight. The pros and checks and balances system is already built in. It is a large number. There is no single agency. For example, FIU is one agency which is dealing with the financial intelligence unit, financial intelligence system. Then there is customs agency. There is internal revenue system. Then there are a whole lot of other agencies. It is not single agency. So I think so far as independence is concerned, there have not been any reports that there is, unless it is a state-sponsored kind of a thing. Otherwise, to a certain degree, because there are systems in the FATF which is known as mutual evaluation and peer-to-peer -peer evaluation. For example, I would go to your country, my country, and I would assess along with the team of legal technical experts and then have your assessment. In case you are not impartial, that will come in my report. It would be put before, placed before the FATF plenary. But there have been no instances because there are different agencies which are implementing. Some are law enforcement agencies, some are intelligence collecting agencies, others are coordinating agencies and the whole country and the, all the agencies they cannot be they cannot be hand in glove and there is already checks and balance system is in built and FATF has a peer to peer review and mutual evaluation system where they find out that these are the deficiencies then the countries are asked and then again monitoring is done so that way it is taken care of yes it's a very Uh, looking uh, the issue from uh, perspective of from the angle of a country which is uh, very weak uh, in regards to this problem, which is Afghanistan and Afghanistan. And then seeing that the most uh, developed countries of the world are failing, uh, what do you think? How we can control the situation from there? Uh, those weak countries, when they're not able to do it with the very uh, developed countries. And uh, for example, with regards to money laundering law, we have passed the money laundering law. Uh, that's why tax uh, were not blacklisted. Uh, it was last year. We have money laws. The problem is that uh, Afghanistan is still the most important producer of opium, for example. And uh, the money which is uh, produced from that, it is coming from other countries, mainly. Obviously, there is some consumption inside. And it cannot come, as you said, and, and how it can. Because the banks, you know that our banks are so, so, so poor, it's not in the banks. I cannot understand this. this there's something which we don't know still in the middle. For example, yes, I agree with you that if the larger company, uh, larger countries, and the developed nations, they have been grappling with the problem, and how we can expect from a smaller countries and those countries who are having weaker institutional mechanisms and who are quite more vulnerable, certainly. But there are ways and means. For, for example, in your country, it is having it is a signatory. It is it is a member of FATF. They have their institutions. They have as well. they have you have law. So therefore, our new the FATF has introduced an effectiveness index. That is immediate outcome. Till now, as I mentioned yeah. during my, there, there are two kinds of measures. One is technical compliance. So all those countries, they, whosoever become member, they will say, yes, we have this financial intelligence unit. We have enforcement. Implementation is the problem. There, of course, it is a, it is a function of political will. The leadership, so the leadership, and then again and again, 
the there would be mutual evaluation reports there would be peer to peer review and those deficiencies would come and it would be all different countries they would bid, build informal pressures and formal pressures so ultimately in an incremental fashion they would have to be integrated otherwise for example united states has created an institution of ctpat and authorized economic operators concept that they want that in the logistics chain those countries which are not compliant let's say if your country is not compliant and if they are having a trade with you that the, they have got a mechanism of ctpat and authorized economic operators so they will ask you that if you want to enter into a trade and business agreement with us your company should be this 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 compliant because we want we are signatory to that you are also signatory to that ctpat is known as customs trade partnership against terrorism i think they have done all this so if they have done it they have become compliant yeah but it will the problem is that they are not connected and good catch for example consumption of the british production of Europe. All these barriers are broken to go up there. The money is coming, but the money is produced not only in Afghanistan, but it is when you was each water, you know that the, the, the income is higher and up to up to I said I'm is a big issue because in your country, for example, it is the narcotics which is responsible for generation of large huge chunk of illegitimate money yeah. and there are certain factions in your country which take responsibility for the safeguarding and safe movement of those illicit produce that is the opium and uh, opium and those other things so from that side and i know it is a golden uh, golden it's golden present golden golden triangle golden triangle so narcotic related is being taken by the other institutional measures and it is a big problem it is a big problem no, how are is a big problem those are against i know i know from from our side i don't know how those developed countries are not controlled from this tell me why they are there we know that no, why yes, yes so far as you so know then yes yes i got your point so far as the movement of narcotics is concerned there are certain variable factors there are certain reasons in your country that because of let's say some weak institutional mechanism it has not they have not been able but the other countries of course they have stringent law with respect to the import they whenever importation takes place they have their at the borders they have their own machinery which detects they have their sniffer dogs they they will take the detection tests for example they will uh, take and they have the uh, profile analysis of those countries consignments coming from of certain goods of certain chemical from certain destination which are known as vulnerable nations those would be put to extra export and import controls and they would be uh, they would be those checks and balance checks would be carried out at the borders and certainly uh, the, the, the so far as the uh, treatment of narcotics in other countries is concerned they have their own laws and machinery in place so maybe if for some reason or the other it is not it is some uh, deficiency is there in your country or in some xyz country but definitely the other countries they are uh, they have their own for example in my country the zmb bsa it is a uh, they would be uh, straight away if there is some narcotics is caught that they would be 10 years imprisonment under the narcotics charges and cyber fraud charges is it in us also if some is caught uh, in those kind of uh, designated like uh, id uh, cyber fraud substances and narcotics there would be punishment but there are certain other countries which are equally porous or which have some tolerance here probably you might have enforcement problems where the united nation office against drug and crime they engage with them then there is a study of the global financial fund flows of the narcotics narcotics from a destination point of view there are measures in place i think there are measures in place and uh when you mentioned about these sources of money they can terrorists i was also uh kind of expecting you to put oil as well yes they yes. are selling oil oil, 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 oil i think i put oil oil, 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 oil is there natural resources i put this oil oil is oil. there i mean oil is there oil and natural resources okay. they are using it in the ground in the corner control okay. of oil 
But in the graph, I didn't see that's where I... In the graph, probably, I thought, maybe I'll cover it next slide, but oil is actually one of the sources. So, uh, I was wondering, like, in this high technology developed century, I mean, even from Google, we can see our house, we can spot our house, but why they cannot, I mean, all this intelligence, all this community international cannot track who's getting this oil from this, and where is it going? I mean, they can track this. Taken back. Your containers, the containers can be tracked. The movement of the vehicle can be tracked. The movement of the persons can be tracked. But how do I differentiate whether it is a legitimate vehicle, whether it is a illegitimate vehicle, unless and until there is some identification mark or there is some tracking instrument which is attached with that illegitimate person, so that all the legitimate goods are also going, along with it, illegitimate goods are also moving. So how do you differentiate from the geospatial intelligence and the focus and those? Uh, geospatial images that you have that which one is the illegitimate one can you from the images I will have the images how do I know this truck there would be images of different trucks moving in a port carrying let's say very large VLCC vehicles ships are going on going in the sea how do I know which ship is carrying the illegitimate oil and which is carrying legitimate legitimate oil how do I do the tracking does that mean they keep selling oil get bigger and bigger money so this is no way of stopping this or because there is a lot and yeah. some G20 countries also claim yeah. that there, there is I would say not with respect to oil let's say with respect to the stolen artifacts United Nations uh, Security Council has a resolution which says that any of the cultural artifacts from Iraq or from Syria they should be confiscated they should be seized likewise using the geospatial imagery we have in India we map the narcotics from different, depending upon the concentration of the sap of the plant. So you can find out which one, there are certain territories which are, uh, India uses legitimate narcotics also. So there are see, uh, so Do you see that's the reason that this technology is not so developed that you cannot differentiate the legit, the legit oh, or no, 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 interest also behind some hidden interest? Oh, no, I don't think, I don't think this technology is quite worked and so far as the Differentiation is concerned, maybe it might not be there in the public domain because of the security reasons, other, otherwise security installation etc. that also will come up. So there is a restriction, but technology is there, but to find out, to differentiate, that becomes slightly difficult. That becomes slightly difficult. But yes, so far as the oil movement and diversion is concerned, the red flag indicators are there in the system that if oil is coming from such and such geographical locations with ISIL, they have their dominance. Those banking transactions that would be before delivery of the payment, if it is through the banking channel, that would be put to extra CDTs, those customer due diligence and know your customer. So whom the ultimate payment is going to. So that is financial institutions have been given. Special advisories are there. Advisories given by the financial intelligence unit that this oil would be like the dark diamonds or the bloody diamonds. There is a Kimberley process. Likewise, the institutional mechanism is going to be set. There would be some that this is a dirty oil. So we should not, we, we can only dissuade like to, uh, to answer our uh, question that if we have a problem at the origin, at the destination, there can be stringent checks and balances so that it doesn't get through. Likewise, it is in the process. It is in the process. Thank you. No, just, just to comment on, on this question too, uh, you know, uh, I think there will be a little bit more concerted effort with the intelligence. We, we know what oil fields in eastern Syria that ISIL controls. And I think there's a little bit more concerted what you're talking about is maybe getting at the origin yesterday of the strike was led, struck yes. uh, 100 oil. Uh, the so. I think there's uh, one more uh, uh, important uh, thing that I wanted to share with the audience. This is with respect to ISIS. So this is a, I think I can share it with them, this is the land of ISIS. Jihadi organization in control of swaths in Syria and Iraqi territory. The trade in oil has been declared as a prime target by the international military coalition fighting the group and yet, yet it goes undisturbed. Yes, it is a question of concern. And it, it, it is complicated because unfortunately that oil that, that comes out of there, you know, the coalition is concerned about a couple of things. Is one is obviously environmental and damage that you can do by, by taking it out of the source. Second part of that is a lot of that oil actually, ISIS is benefiting from selling it to our allies to include rebel groups within inside Syria. 
So it's, it's not as easy as taking it out, but, but maybe those restrictions get lifted. And they are also having problems with the refining of the oil. Of course, it is a technology driven thing. The crude oil that has to be converted into refined oil. So these SM people, they are not having that technology to refine it. So they are also grappling with the problem. It is not so easy. If you have access to the oil well, there has to be technology to drill it out, to refine it at different fractional distillation stages. So they don't have the wherewithal and the technology. So they are also, it is not that this is so easier for them. Unless they, they start controlling the refining costs. Yes, they are trying, they are thinking about that. They are they are they are they are they are they are changing from oil other resources as well. So this is recent recently this grows uh, after the pandemic. No, I think in addition to oil they have all so many other things which uh, are the sources for their financing and funding. And I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. I thank you all so